In this video, we are going to look how to check our model using different diagnostics tools, specifically how to use residuals to check the model assumptions, but also how to use QQ plots and how to detect outliers. In this video, we are going to examine them in the context of regular linear models, and in the next one, we'll see how to expand them to generalized linear models. In linear regression, we assume the following model that consists of a systematic component and a random component. We assume that the random component has a mean of zero and constant variance. Sometimes we also assume that it distributes normal. The response or raw residuals are defined to be the difference between the actual responses, the y's, and the predicted ones. If our model is correct, then the coefficient estimates are almost equal to the real coefficients, and so the residuals are a proxy to the random component. As such, we should expect them to have a mean of zero, constant variation, and under the normality assumption, a normal distribution. These residuals are usually good enough, but if we want to be a bit more accurate, then we should remember that the beta hat is actually estimated from the data, and so is a random variable. If you pause the video and follow the math here, you can see that the residuals will have a mean of zero, but the variance won't be constant. Note that this matrix is called a hat matrix, because it puts the hat on y, and so we denote it by h. It is an idempotent matrix, the diagonal of this matrix, denoted by hi, are called the leverages. We'll get back to these soon. If we correct for the different variances, we'll get the standardized residuals, which are defined like this. This ensures that the variance of the residuals is constant. The studentized residuals is when we also divide by the estimate of the sigma, and get that the variance is approximately 1. Approximately because of the estimation. If we knew the real sigma, it should be equal to 1. If we assume normality, then these residuals follow a t-distribution, which is approximately normal for a large n. We can even go one step further and realize that our estimates for sigma include all of the observations. But if an observation has a high residual, for example if it's an outlier, this can inflate the estimate. So the deletion residuals are defined to be this, where the sigma estimate includes all observations except the ith one. Some nomenclature warning. Studentized is sometimes called standardized, and deletion is sometimes called studentized. For example, in R, the R standard function gives these residuals, and the R student gives these residuals. Now, here is how healthy residuals should look like. The x-axis is the predictor, and the y is the residual. There should be no apparent pattern to them, and they should seem with more or less equal spread from the zero mean. If we see a pattern in the residual plot, that can suggest a problem in our model. For example, suppose we used x in the fitted model, but a true model uses x squared. The residual plot in this case shows a clear pattern. Getting the systematic component wrong means that our beta estimators are also wrong. The example from before is when we have a simple linear regression with a single x. But what happens if we have multiple x's? There are a few options. One is to plot the residuals against each different x and look for a pattern. This could work, but one problem is that the true relation between x and y might be masked due to the complex interplay of the different variables. Another option is to use the partial residuals. These are the regular residuals after we add to them the relevant predictors. For example, the partial residuals of x1 are defined as follows. Plotting the partial residuals against their corresponding x should hopefully reveal the true relation between that x and y since we are essentially removing the effects of the other variables. We can also detect problems in the random component of our model. Here we see that the variance increases as x increases, which is an indication of atherosclerosticity, which violates the constant variance assumption. This means that the estimator isn't optimal. It's not the best according to the Gauss-Marker theorem. We can then remedy this by estimating the variance and running weighted least squares instead of ordinary least squares. This example is actually quite common, as many real-world phenomena are measured on a scale in which the precision depends on the magnitude. For multiple regression, we can plot the residuals against the estimated y's. Be cautious not to mix y hat with y and plot the residuals against the y. Here's an example of such plot coming from a perfectly healthy fit. We see a clear pattern. The points seem to arrange themselves on the y equal x line. What does this mean? Well, nothing actually. This is expected. 
In the above part, you can see what happens when we plot the residuals against the predicted values. Developing both sides, we get that we are plotting epsilons against the x beta. We assume here that we had a perfect fit and that the estimated betas are equal to the real betas. In any case, we don't expect to see any pattern here. On the other hand, the bottom part shows what happens when plotting the residuals against the true y's. We get epsilons on both sides, and so we expect to see something that resembles a y equal x line. We can also test the normality assumption if we made one. There are statistical tests that we can run on the residuals, such as Kolmogorov, Smirnov, Shapiro, Wilk, etc. I won't go into them in this video. There are also QQ plots. These are graphs where we plot the quantile of the actual data versus the quantile of some distribution, in our case, the normal distribution. If the data indeed comes from a normal distribution, we expect to see that the data points will arrange in a straight line on the QQ plot. Here is an example of a normal distributed data. On the left, you can see a histogram and KDE graph. On the right, you can see the corresponding QQ plot. You can see that the data points in purple are arranged almost perfectly on the straight line. When the slope is smaller than the straight line of the normal distribution, this suggests that there are more points in this region compared to the normal distribution. When the slope is higher, this suggests less points compared to the normal distribution. Here we see that the slope in the beginning is less than the straight diagonal line of the normal distribution, suggesting an accumulation of points on the left, and then it becomes greater than the diagonal line, suggesting the observations are further apart. This fits with a distribution that has a right tail. Here is the opposite example of a left-tailed distribution. We see that the QQ graph is exactly mirrored from before. Here the slope is lower in both sides, suggesting that the distribution has thinner tails or smaller kurtosis. And here the slope is higher on both sides, suggesting that the distribution has thicker tails or higher kurtosis. There are also ways to automatically detect outliers. One way is by using Cook's distance, which incorporates both the residual value and its leverage, meaning is the observation located in a sensitive location. What is leverage? Well, remember the hat matrix from before? Notice that we get that the predicted y's are a linear combination of the actual y values. The leverages are the diagonal of the h matrix. That is, the leverage hi is measuring how much did yi had a say in determining the value of y hat i. A high leverage indicates that it contributed a lot, and a low means it contributed little. And it can be proved that the leverages are between 1 over n and 1. In regular linear models, h only depends on x, but this is not true for GLMs. Cook's distance is defined to be this quantity over here. We can see that it incorporates both the residuals, corrected for the number of coefficients and for the variance, and it also incorporates the leverage, giving a higher value to higher leverages. We can then plot the distances against the observation index and see if we spot any observations that have high distance which are potential outliers. We can then correct for them by either fixing the problem or considering removing the data point. Let's try to understand what role the leverage has. In both plots here, we see the data points in purple and the true regression line in orange. In the red line, we can see what happens when we accidentally add a value of five to a single observation. This increases the residual of that observation quite a lot. On the left, you can see the effect of this when we chose a point with a low leverage. We see that the new regression line is very similar to the old one. On the right, you can see what happens when we chose a point with a high leverage. We see the change to the regression line is much more severe. Finally, let's see how we can get these diagnostics in R. For the residuals, we can either use the residual function or the resid function over a fitted model. We can also specify the type of the residual and specify we want the partial residuals, for example. If we want the standardized or the studentized residuals, we can use the R standard and R student functions. For the QQ plots, we can use the QQ norm and QQ line functions from base R or the stat QQ and stat QQ line for a ggplot type of graph. For the leverages, we can use the hat values function for the Cook's distance, we can use the Cook's distance function. Here is a simple script that summarizes all of these commands. You can pause the screen to have a better look. This is all for this video. In the next one, we'll see how to expand these concepts 
and apply them to GLMs. See you there.